Thanks for joining us for an episode of the Make Things Better podcast. Today we were joined by Will Francis, a technology, digital and social media expert. I personally learned so much from this podcast and I think it would be particularly useful for anyone who works at an organisation where maybe you don't have the biggest budget in the world, but you still want to smash social media. So thanks for watching and please do enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to episode 28 of the Make Things Better podcast. Today I'm joined by Will Francis. Welcome on the show, Will. How are you doing today? I'm great, cheers, Tom. I'm really good. Um, and thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Well, I really enjoyed your session uh, with the DMA the other week. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into uh, working for the, the DMA or IDM? I'm not quite sure what they're really called, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, do you know what? Neither am I. I still invoice the IDM, and I don't even know if that's what they call themselves, but they, they keep paying me to do it, so that's cool. Um, so basically, I've been working in digital for nearly 20 years. Um, I started just doing kind of mucking around with the internet in its early years, and and I was in a band as well, so you know, I'd, I'd create like a website for the band and things like that, and, and then MySpace came along in the mid noughties and that really captivated me. That was the first time something really kind of, yeah, captivated me like that. And I got very into it. I knew it inside out. I knew how to use it, how to grow band profiles there. Um, and yeah, d did that well. And then uh, MySpace expanded after Rupert Murdoch bought it and they opened an office in the UK and I went for a job and I got one because I had all these like nasty hacky workarounds and ways of making profiles look nice. Um, and then, yeah, I sort of went through that for a few years and I became the editor of the site, basically running, you know, the, the content and the relationships with um, uh, film artists, music artists and that kind of thing to a degree, along with other colleagues there. And um, yeah, and that's it was at that time, actually, in the late noughties that I started to see brands wanting to get involved in social media because at the end of the day, marketers and brands, all they really care about is where are the audience, where is the attention? And up until that point, really, at the turn of the millennium, all the attention was on TV with some on print and outdoor radio. So that's where they spent their money. And the internet came along, didn't get taken very seriously to start with. But then when social media started really sucking up lots of time you know people weren't sat in front of the telly for hours every evening they were starting to spend more time David what are you doing upstairs you know I'm on the internet I'm surfing the web <laughs> uh, no one used the phone because I'm on dial-up you know and more people were starting to uh, spend time on that and of course 07 saw the launch of the iPhone and that was another pivotal pivotal point where more it was you know you didn't have to go upstairs on the family computer you could do it on your phone and by about 2010 that had matured to the point where you could just sit and basically lose an evening looking at social media on your phone right and because things like instagram came along as well as facebook at that time so and i saw brands wanting a piece of that attention and it was kind of clunky and awkward because they wanted pro, you know at myspace they wanted like a profile like Ford Motors or Coca-Cola would want a profile and like, yeah, but you're not a person. And how does that work? This is a social space. And in a lot of ways, I don't think brands have really surmounted that. You know, I think a lot of brands, they're occupying these kind of person shaped holes in places like Twitter and TikTok and Instagram. And most of them still haven't got a clue how to um, how to operate there. And they default to just basically spamming people with their brand assets and their like campaign messages you know uh, which i think is interesting because had you have asked me back then i would have absolutely guessed that it would all be kind of sorted out by now and, and and brands would know what they're doing so anyway that that was that and then in 2010 i went and worked at one of the big global ad agencies and then uh, a year or two later started my own agency in london um worked with a lot of big entertainment tech fashion brands um and then i exited out of that a few years ago and since then i've been basically telling other people how to do it through um the big institutions like the cim and the dma in the uk the digital marketing institute in ireland and globally and the american marketing association so i'm just on a, I'm, I'm basically on this mad i found myself on this mad mission to <laughs> to just 
save people from I mean that sounds like I'm putting myself on some sort of messiah pedestal <laughs> isn't it? But I'm trying to just save people from bad marketing there's so much of it still about um, from really major brands that should know better because they, they don't really know what else to do yeah yeah that's really interesting to hear because the way I actually ended up getting this job at Hive IT where I'm sort of doing a marketing kind of role is that before I had my own business where I talk about football and I had like a website and I had some people who would basically consume my podcast talking about football and analysis of it. And then what happened was someone from Hive got in touch with me because they listened to that football podcast and they wanted someone to come in and do some marketing. So I've kind of gone through that shift where you've gone from being an individual, you can say whatever you know, you want really, and you kind of just representing yourself, but no one else to represent in a brand instead, which is a big, big shift. And if I'm honest, I've kind of been on a journey myself over the last year and a half trying to figure out, right, how do we get across that we're just like a group of people trying to make good things happen. And it's quite hard to do that um, as a brand. And I feel like, as you say, a lot of brands haven't really figured out exactly how to do that yet. So I can definitely relate to what you were saying there. But the, the the big difference is between what you were doing before and what you're doing now is now there's an ask. You're not just saying, here's a cool thing, end of story. You've now got to say, here's a cool thing. And by the way, if, I've got, if I'm going to keep my job, I also need to ask you a favor. Now you've enjoyed this lovely content. Could you just click here? Could you give us your email address? Could you sign up and go to this landing page? You know, and there's always that, well, it... it there is the pressure on marketers like yourself to weave that ask in somewhere and you don't have that as a creator but that is the key difference and that's you know that's why marketers and brands they look at something like tiktok and like wow all well, these people are going viral on tiktok so therefore we'd be able to go viral but then they go on to tiktok and they can't they can't help but weave in the ask but then there are brands that do get it obviously you look at someone like Ryanair who are like the go-to example of a brand on tiktok they don't ask for anything back. They just make really silly videos about talking planes, memes. I mean, they're literally, they're clearly not precious about it. They just pump them out. They're just having fun. And it just makes the feed a bit more of a chuckle. That's it. They don't ask for anything back. Um, and they are in the 0.1% of brands that can do that. But it's only by doing that that you build a relationship with people. And it, you know what? If you build a relationship with Ryanair because you enjoy their videos... When, you, when it comes time, you want a cheap flight to Rome, you know where to go. You know, you don't need to be reminded by the next post in the feed, like click the link in bio and all that kind of stuff. You don't need that. You know where to go because a brand that has done that work of building a relationship with you just through offering content, they occupy a space in your head. You know, they're living in your head <laughs> rent free, as the saying goes. And when it comes time that a consumer wants their thing, like I say, they, they know where to go. Pe people... People know yeah, they're not stupid. Yeah, definitely. So how do you reconcile that? Yeah. I'm interested. Like, how do you do that content marketing in the purest sense? Like content marketing. Um, and how do you manage the urge to ask for something back, like a click to a product or service or something? I'm keen to ask you about charities in particular as well, because at Hive we do try and work with quite a few charities and do like mm. tech for good sort of projects. And in that space what a charity often needs they need many things they want to really get people involved and you know use their services and make the most of it and help and support people but also what they're going to need is the donation side and so without asking for those donations how do they get those donations i think that's a very good question and it's one that at least should be asked and talked about um look it's like, I don't want to bang on about that same point, but it's like any relationship, right? Um, you know, if you have a friend, there are times when you will expect, you know, you'll need to be listened to more or you'll need to ask a favor. Can I borrow this? Can I stay around your house? Uh, you know, whatever. Um, and there's times when they'll ask you for stuff. and there's But most of the time you just chat and hang out and no one asks anyone for anything, really. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that's sort of how relationships work in a balanced way. So what I'm getting around to saying is, yes, absolutely ask. Just don't do it every time. And um, But also, I think, without sounding like too much of a purist about the point, I think you can almost never ask. Because I think, again, um, if you if you motivate people 
through really good content that just ca captivates them, they will know where to act. Now, there's a whole other thing to talk about there. Algorithms and paid social. So th the first thing to sort of say is that with paid social, absolutely. That is where you can absolutely ask for stuff. You can ram the sales message down people's throats. You paid for the privilege. And by the way, you can do so in a very predictable way. Personally, I think if you've got a business objective, like getting clicks to a donation page, and you're trying to drive that through an organic social media post, you're basically insane because you're you're reliant on um, something that is completely unpredictable. I mean, you might as well write it on bits of paper and leave it on park benches. It's that unpredictable and unreliable as a, as a format, as a channel, organic social. So, you know, if a charity came to me and said, we need a thousand clicks to this donation landing page by next Friday, I wouldn't post it in bloody organic social media. I'd say, great, a thousand, a thousand clicks. I can make that happen reliably. Who do you want to make those clicks? Tell me all about them. Yep, and I'll make sure it's those people. You just need a bit of money. You don't need loads of money. It's, obviously, it's not free, but it is... It's 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 a business like way of driving that traffic and that those those kind of hard commercial results. Um, so I think you know we've arrived in a place where the distinction is quite clear. Organic social media is for building a relationship with people, and paid social media is for putting those asks in front of them. And ideally, I don't think you should ever really put those asks in your organic. I think you should let the ads do that. Um, and keep them quite separate because there's clarity both for you in terms of your expectations. Because personally, when people come on my courses and they say, you know, we measure our social media performance by clicks, I'm like, oh, really? Like, that's not how you measure the efficacy of organic social content. It's a terrible, it's the worst channel for driving clicks. Um, you know, the only way to reliably do that is through ads. And also the other thing to say is, look, as a bit of a check, you know, a bit of a filter when you put stuff out. If you're telling people to do something, asking people to do something, and you're not paying for that message to go out, you're probably doing it wrong, just in general, I think, you know? Um, so think about that dichotomy of, you know, organic social media and paid social media. Because the other thing to mention is then algorithms, right? The reason why we have to be so careful about what we put in organic social media is because that whole system now is run by algorithms and if you look at TikTok, we're talking to an extreme degree, but everyone's copying TikTok, so everybody's becoming more algorithmic. And what the algorithm does is it picks the cream of social media and presents it to people because that's the content that will keep people on the platform longer and get people looking at more ads, okay? And on most platforms, every third or fourth post is an ad. And so, and roughly when someone looks at an ad, the platform makes about half a cent, a cent, something like that. If someone clicks an ad, it's a few quid, right? It's quite a bit of money. So there's big money to be lost by showing people anything other than the cream of what is on that platform. So, I mean, that, that, just that fact alone, like if you're not in the cream of content, like the very best content, the greatest hits album content of that platform, the algorithm's basically chucking you in the bin because it's got better things to show people to keep them on the platform. And we're moving to a world, thanks to TikTok, where it's it's really becoming irrelevant who you follow. So even if, the, even if people follow your charity, your brand, that's becoming less and less relevant. The algorithm's just showing, you know, if I've, if I've watched DIY videos all the way through, it's just gonna show me more DIY videos, regardless of who I follow, because that's what keeps me for longer. Now the TikTok, really pushed that approach hard when they came up with this almost completely algorithmic feed. But now Instagram, Facebook are copying that. Um, and so it's it's really kind of do or die. It's a really pivotal, pivotal time, I think, for brands. Start creating the cream or basically just, just run mm, ads. Mm. <laughs> it's interesting because what comes to mind for me is almost like there's this inequality being perpetuated by the algorithms because because what mm. you then got is like whoever can create the the cream like the highest quality content that people actually want to watch that's genuinely entertaining that's going to keep people on the screens they're the ones who are going to benefit the most from the algorithm but what if they can only make it through having a budget you know uh what if you've got like a smaller company or charity they don't have a big budget they're focused on doing all these other things how do they really 
create that quality that's actually going to get them to stand out and make it worthwhile doing that is the logical <laughs> yeah. next question isn't it and that's when i tell people what i've just told you people are like okay that does make sense how do i do that you know and i don't believe it requires budgets i re i think i think the first thing it requires is just an acknowledgement of all those facts but also an acknowledgement that you know this isn't hollywood it's not like the 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 pop music charts here there there's not like just one leaderboard of what's the cream of tiktok or instagram um what is the perfect content for your audience might be not perfect it probably isn't perfect for anyone else you know and, and everybody has their own individually curated feed by these algorithms so it's uh don't worry about big production the flashiest most creative crazy videos and what have you it's not about that the first thing it starts with is understanding your audience i know i'm sounding a bit old school and you know educational academic here but it really is about going back to understanding your audience you know if you're a a, a a dog's charity, you know, a dog's home, something like that, right? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, pictures of dogs, videos of dogs. Don't stop there. You know, talk to some people and ask them, but what is it? What What do you really kind of uh, like about dogs? Maybe do a bit of a survey of your audience and then test some different stuff as well. See if it's um, dog petting and cleaning tips, um, how to keep them. Maybe it's um, emotional stories of rescues, and which we know it does really well. Um but try different formats, different things. Keep it lo-fi. You know, you can create incredible content on the phone in your pocket. Like, this thing has been used to shoot Hollywood movies that have gone on general release. There are about five movies at this point that have gone out on general release that were shot on phones. You know, the uh, first one was Tangerine in 2017 and looked beautiful, you know. It's not about not having the right budget. I don't think that's that's not people's hurdle. They haven't sat down and thought, what do our audience want? They're not audience-centric enough. That's the problem. You know, I think I feel like sometimes I'm living in a parallel universe when I run the courses like the one you came on because, like, a lot of... It does seem that a lot of marketers haven't stopped to consider that they are basically dog-fooding their audience. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, have you? <laughs> I've not heard of that, but I can see where I, I think I know where it's going. going. Carry on, yeah, yeah. They're dog food yeah. in their audience. They're basically feeding their audience stuff they would never eat themselves. Mm. You know, and um, everyone's doing it. Like, you know, come on, look at your look at the way that you your thumb is just on hyperdrive, right? When you're just scrolling yeah. through the Instagram feed or Facebook or whatever, um, and to some extent on TikTok, um, and. Unless some unless something pulls you towards it because there's something in it for you, I'm not going on social media for other people's benefit. I'm on there for my benefit as a user, and I'm looking for stuff that's got information for me that's going to feed my brain in some way. Um, and so only something that is... I mean, all good content is one of two things. It's either useful or entertaining. That's it. And unless it's got that value baked into it that it's just really useful it's going to show me a hack or something really useful or it's going to entertain me like it's going to make me emotional laugh cry whatever unless it's got something in it for me that i need to see i'm just going to whiz past it like 99 percent of the other stuff and yet marketers when they put stuff out they they don't think wow would i really care about this if i don't if i didn't work here um or maybe i think some people will come on my courses to be honest they don't have the bravery to stand up to the people they're working with and the people above them and say Do you know what i'm not sure pumping all this stuff out is actually a good idea because i'm not sure if we're honest with ourselves any of us here would welcome this into our feed and i feel like it's a treadmill that marketers have kind of got on where they feel like they just need to keep feeding social media and there's no time to stop and go kind of why are we doing this who is this for and why you know why is it getting such poor engagement and is there something better we could do? I mean, just really basic fundamental questions. And like I say, major brands are doing it. I don't know if you want to edit this bit out, this bit out, but I don't, and, and I don't know if I said this when on the course it, you came was on. Was it D D DFS or? You, yeah, <laughs> Dreams Beds, right. D Dreams Beds, right, yeah. <laughs> so whether you want to leave this in is up to you, but like Dreams Beds, just what a fantastic example. A major brand, major Olympic sponsor, 
and they're just putting pictures of beds up just because they just someone thinks that's the job and yet no one in their right mind would you know want that in their feed even the people that work there don't want it in their social media feeds personally um it's it's very strange i remember those posts were getting like only you know a few likes as well like less than 20 likes and i'm pretty sure dreams beds had like hundreds of thousands of followers so you know the amount of people who were seeing that or maybe not seeing it because of the algorithms filled it out after the first few well, hundred that's what's thousand happening. people yeah that, that's exactly what's happening yeah um but what i guess what you're getting at is like what is the point in seeing that? Like, what is the point in anyone having a look at a bed on Instagram? Like, why would why would anyone want to have a look at a bed on Instagram? If if someone could just go on Google Images and see the exact same thing, and there's no, like, story behind it, then what is really the point in it? And how would that differentiate them from anyone else as well? Like, it's never going to create an emotional connection either, and there's no sort of storytelling aspect to it just just having a photo to have a bed right absolutely you know and and it takes that extra leap of creativity um it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be like oscar winning but i mean just you know something relating to beds like do something about sleep do something about how beds are made about furniture making in general i don't know i mean i i can't solve their problem but it's got whatever it is. It's got to be more interesting than that, and and um, I think that yeah. Look, a lot of people are just stuck, and they're not quite sure what to do. And I'm not sure if they have the permission internally to kind of rip it up at this point. It's so established, isn't it? As like a process, like we must just keep posting on Instagram three times a week or whatever. It's, it's like no one's got the permission to go. Hang on a minute. Sorry, sorry. No, <laughs> can we just have a chat about why we're doing this? Um, I think everybody feels like they might be, they might look really stupid. That might be seen as a daft question. Everybody might ridicule and go, what do you mean why we're doing it? It's Instagram. Like everybody's doing Instagram, you know, they might be, um, yeah. So I can understand that. That is, it's tricky. And I think a lot of marketers are in that position. Um, and you know, I think charities, like I get a lot of people from charities on my courses as well. And I think charities are in exactly the same situation, really. I th and, but the problem that charities have often is they're quite resource poor, budget poor. Um, they don't, you know, they're, they're, they're as busy as anyone else, at least, yeah. if not more so, your average yeah. charity marketer. Because, of course, they don't have the luxury of lots of resource to throw around the place, right? And they have to be very lean in what they do. And I, and I, I sympathise with that, but I think it's never a bad time to just stop and take stock and um, go back to looking at who your donors are, your core donors are. What is it that they care about? What keeps them up at night? What do they fear? What are their values? What do they think's important? What do they think's funny? Um, what do they think's cute and adorable? I mean, you just try and find these things out. What is in the back of their heads? Because if you're able to speak to what's actually in people's heads already, that's what latches us, that's what hooks us as people. Um, I can't remember who it was. It was one of the titans of advertising said something like, great advertising continues the conversation taking place in people's heads, right? Mm. Now, the big holy grail, in case, I don't know if you, uh, how much you've like thought about this, but the great holy grail in advertising is to be the first brand to speak to part of someone. Um, like a very famous example is like Dove. Yeah, back in 20 years ago, Ogilvy, massive agency, um, helped Dove launch the Real Beauty campaign. And they were the first beauty brand ever to say, do you know what? Beauty marketing is broken, it's terrible, and it's making everyone feel terrible about themselves. And it's actually totally fine to be a normal uh, person. We're gonna celebrate looking beautiful in a very natural way they were the first people to do that and that land grab as a brand was it's i mean it's, it's one of the biggest upticks in brand affinity and loyalty and ultimately commercial results that's ever been seen uh they went from being just another soap to being like one of the most popular um beauty brands out there and so you know that that's the holy grail but you don't have to be first 
you don't have to be that kind of um, revolutionary um but you do have to speak to something that is already going on inside people's heads i think and, yeah. and you just need to find out what those things are first and then you will hook them um with your content yeah so i guess sometimes it's going to take some bravery and you have to almost step out of what you've been doing and kind of stop looking at what everyone else is doing sometimes as well i'd imagine i mean I don't know, from my perspective anyway, there's nothing wrong with having a look at what the best people in marketing are doing and seeing what is gaining a lot of attention, looking at who is getting like millions of views on YouTube or whatever else. But sometimes it can be a lot easier to just go, all right, that company is similar to us. What are they doing? And then you end up having all these sort of companies, brands doing similar things that aren't really very effective and they're all kind of the same. I think charity is probably quite guilty of that. Maybe all brands are uh, thinking about it, but I, I do think there's there's maybe a bit of risk averseness in charities. It feels like there's a lot on the line. And again, I, I, would I be any different if I worked for a charity? I'm, no, I'm sure I wouldn't be. I would be risk averse. I would really worry about messing it up and you know putting a, a, dent, a dent in this year's donations because of my stupid ideas. Like I, I get it. Um, there, but yeah, there is that issue are definitely um you know charities of certain types and categories do seem to do very similar stuff um and uh i think there is something about trying to stand out it doesn't have to be crazy um but um something that just speaks to a new a new part of the consumer's heads that other your competitors aren't currently doing i think that's the, the key thing yeah yeah definitely um and I think I'm definitely risk averse in my role. You know, I would, like our company works with, you know, like the Department for Education. It works with a few like local charities. I don't want to do anything that's going to mess up any client, client relations or anything like that. So, you know, I, I totally admit, like, I'm not great at marketing at all. Like, I'll say that happily on this podcast. Like, I'm just, I'm just not. Like, I'm keen to learn, but so far it's, yeah, it's hard to be good at marketing if you don't want to do anything that's going to mess things up. And I think that's totally normal and rational. Uh, rational. So, yeah, um, what tips would you have then for charities to improve their marketing on like a limited budget? Let, let, let's formalise it. I, I, think, um, I think it's always a good time to do a bit of a homemade digital strategy. You don't have to bring some expensive agency in um uh you don't have to spend money you can just do this maybe in some spare time i know you've not got any spare time but some time that you can carve out right if you just did it for an hour a day for a week or two you could do this in five or ten hours um so have a refreshed digital strategy and the the sections would really go for me as follows um i would focus on very specific objectives for the next three six twelve months whatever feels right for you and um, the, I think the problem with marketers or the problem with being a marketer, one of the things that drives you mad as a marketer is there are a million things that you could do and could achieve. Right. Yeah. It's sh it, I mean, people talk about shiny ball syndrome in a lot of industries in marketing. It's terrible. It's like, oh, that. And what about that? And now there's this. And I've just read this cool hack for going viral on TikTok. But now people are talking about LinkedIn and, and our video is doing well there and this and that. And there's like all these opportunities screaming out at you that you feel like you must put time into and so you might really have like when you really if you were to go through it you might have like 10 20 objectives that you're actively trying to achieve at one time that's terrible right that that's that's really you're spreading yourself thin you're not really smashing it anywhere and what i would do is i would draw up three objectives and stick to them for a sustained period of time three months okay good six months better 12 months brilliant as long as you feel like you can stick to and if you think right you know what 2023 we are going to build our email list we're going to build tiktok audience and we maybe there's some reason why we're the a linkedin uh you know b2b facing audience something like that but whatever it is um three distinct things and just go after those as digital objectives right for the next few months next six months something like that um Right, so you've got your objectives. Be clear about your KPIs. How are you measuring those objectives? What's the scoreboard? So if you say if you're saying it's grow, we want to grow TikTok, what do you mean by that? Do you mean followers, and also do you mean a certain engagement rate per uh, average likes per video, 
Okay, so just get that down on paper. Um, now you know what the rules of the game are. It's like when you go into a football pitch, you're looking at the scoreboard. That's how you know when you, whether you're winning or not. And that's really important. And you can check in on that at any point, right, you know, during the game. Um, right, the next thing is you need to then uh, research the audience. How are we going to achieve those objectives without knowing the audience? I don't, I don't, I don't really know. So um, it's, it's then doing that audience research. There are so many free tools today, things like keyword research tools, answer the public, Keywords everywhere, keyword surfer, Uber suggest. There's free versions of all these things, um, and particularly you know uh, uh, social media. Just browsing Reddit is a fantastic. Reddit is a brilliant way to find out what grinds people's gears and what people care about because that's what a lot of it is about. It's, it's basically a load of forums, isn't it? Um, in Instagram, TikTok, and all the usual social media sites. Just see what people are talking about, what they seem to care about, what what makes them laugh, cry, and get angry, etc. Right, and start to again focus. Say, well, look, we could speak to everyone, but if you're marketing to everyone, you're marketing to no one. So let's pick one, two, three personas that we're really going to focus on that are relevant. So if we're going to grow our email list uh, and our TikTok audience, let's say their objectives for the next year. Who is that that we, we can most effectively do that um, for? And uh, who, who are the most valuable people to our organization? Um, but focus, focus on them. Because if you've got a very specific persona in mind when you create content, it will speak to them. It will resonate with them. It will, it will speak to a part of them that they, you know, and they'll feel acknowledged and seen by your content. They'll be drawn towards it because it will feel like it's for them, you know. Whereas again, I think a lot of marketing content that goes out, it's not really for anyone. And so it doesn't really grab anyone by the throat. Um, that's a, such a waste of resource, you know. It's better, to, it's better to resonate really strongly with 5% of your audience than just waft past the 100% of your, your audience without anyone really noticing. So I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking about really basic stuff here. <laughs> uh, these aren't like kind of mega future forward hacks. But they're, they're, they're important and, and people aren't doing them enough. Um, and then uh, once you've worked out who, who your personas are, and there's lots of templates for those online, by the way, um, then just go on to your content strategy. Um, so which platforms are we going to use? How are we going to use them? What is going to be our thing there? What are the, what are the main themes that we're going to cover there? Again, keep it focused. We're not doing do everything. Ryanair, it's just talking planes. That's it. You know, so be um, focused about the, the kind of content choices you make, come up with ideas and just run with them. And then also um, some sort of media strategy. However small your budget is, just map out how you're going to use that budget effectively. Um, could be through ads, could also be through promoting and boosting posts, which actually is very effective. It's essentially a gateway drug for advertising. So I'm, I feel like, you know, the platforms make that quite effective and boost and promote your best content, your best organic content to increase its reach. Um, and then also think about how you could work with influencers and creators and get them on board as well as part of that. Um, and then uh, finally, agree who's going to do this stuff, um, how much, and, and try and in a very simple table or something like that, just try and say, right, if we're going to do this and that, who, who's going to do that internally? Does anyone need upskilling? We really want to grow on TikTok. Turns out we've not got anyone who can do video editing. Dave's good at, quite good at this sort of stuff. Send him on a course. You know, So um, just checking that you can actually do this stuff internally. Um, upskilling is so important. There's, there's so many digital skills gaps today. I see that in, because of what I do. And that's why what I do is kind of, I guess, booming at the moment because people are realizing there are all these digital skill gaps. So acknowledge them. It's great having a strategy, but if you can't execute it internally, it's kind of useless. And it doesn't take a lot of training, you know, just to like get people upskilled, really. It's, it's an easy thing to fix and it's much cheaper than hiring new people. And then that's that's it. That's it. That That's basically your strategy. Um, and like I say, don't don't need to take weeks and weeks to do it. You could if you really if you're really pushed, you could do it in a day. I know I'm like being a bit flippant there, but you could. 
Um, and and then that's your North Star. And that's like, that's everything I'm going to do. Every time I come into this office, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to achieve those objectives. I'm going to create content for these people. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to put the, the IDM out of their courses, like out of business. <laughs> really? <laughs> with all of that, I mean, you've just kind of covered everything in 10 minutes there, um, which is mm. fantastic. But... Yeah, I just wish I knew all of that stuff like a year and a half ago, maybe when I first got into marketing myself. And I think hopefully this video will be very useful to anyone who does go away and implement what you've just spoken about there because I think that's a really comprehensive plan and I think it's quite easy to follow in a way. And as you say, some of those ideas are quite simple, but at the same time, I think they are getting missed a lot. You know, I admit that I've missed a lot of those things in the past. Um, but at the same time, I suppose it's just hard for people to find the time to, you know, take a day out and go, right, this is what I'm going to work on today when people are so busy and there's other pressing matters and everything else. But yeah, sometimes just taking a step back, do all of that work, and then you're going to be set. Um, so yeah, fantastic. Uh, final question for you is what can people do to make things better? What's with, yeah, what's with the capitalization to make things better? Is that you, you one of your kind of things or? That's the name of the podcast. It's the Make Things Better podcast. Um, why did I come up with that name? Why did we yeah. come up with that name? I think it's because like at Hive, our sort of main purpose, our like kind of tagline type thing is using technology to make the make a positive difference in our world. And I just needed like three words pretty much. That would be quite sharp and to the point because I think that's what we're all about as a company is trying to make things better essentially and it can also be interpreted either like making things better as in like making websites better making like apps better and what else but it could also be just like making things better for people um so yeah I think that's how we came up with that <sighs> that is a big question it um, is it is <laughs> yeah um well <laughs> okay um i think there are uh, many things that we can do to make things better as organizations um i think that uh the first thing we can do is i, I mean are you talking about marketing things here or interpret it how you really, like so yeah, if you, okay cool. if you want to go down marketing or you can go down the world as a whole you can go down any route you like you really can <laughs> well i think I'll, I'll, I'll probably bring it back to marketing i think that every brand and organization would benefit from being themselves from being authentic, which I know is a massively overused word in the world of branding and marketing and usually means nothing, in fact. And But I do think that. I think that we've seen that so much in recent years with various things happening all the way up to most recently, like the World Cup in Qatar. And, um, th you know, events like that, are like the World Cup, they push people, celebrities, uh, brands, whoever, to really kind of have a think about who they are and, and what they stand for um and whether they like you know whether they want to publicly stand by something or not and you know what people are increasingly looking to brands charities companies um they're, they're increasingly curious about what's going on behind the scenes i think there's been a bit of a you know erosion of trust you know my my parents generation they just they kind of just trusted everything was above board and legitimate and now we realize that's not the case even in i you know sorry to say but even in the charity world you know there's been i think so there's now a bit more cynicism around what happens to that money you donate and what have you and charities have to do a bit of work to reassure donors don't they that this money's all going in the right direction um but similarly with companies um people are curious okay what am i sponsoring here when i buy your chocolate your coffee your cars whatever it is what am i sponsoring am i funding the solution here or am i just funding more of the problem whether it's environmental um whether it's social justice so i think that 
more and more brands like a, a chocolate brand, Tony's Chocolate Only, I think do a great job of being very open about who they are and what they stand for. Patagonia, the fashion brand, have been doing this for years. One of the big examples of that, the body shop. Now, the body shop and Patagonia was, you know, 20 years ago were kind of weird hippie standout examples. But now more brands are taking that seriously. And kind of every big brand is in some way doing that. So I think one way to make things better as, as a company is really work out your values and run your business unwaveringly by those values, the way that you hire, the way that you fire, the way that you you know, work internally, uh, and also how you treat your customers. Um, how you treat your staff will transfer onto how you treat your customers. If you treat your staff in a certain way, they will probably treat your customers in very similar ways. Um, so it, it does transfer to the outside how you run internally. It's, you're not in some sort of sealed bubble. Um, so I suppose just, yeah, making sure that you really run your organization strictly by your values. And then in your marketing, you can actually lean on that. And um, you don't need to apologize for that anymore. I think some organizations are worried that they you know come across a bit too worthy or a bit too earthy or hippie or whatever it is. I don't think, I think that that time has gone. You don't, I think that's actually a strength. Um, and so that's one way um, to make things better. And again, like I say, that goes back to hiring. The great thing about marketing is that anyone can do marketing. It's, a, it's the reason why a lot of people kind of go, in, go into marketing. It's why I ended up in marketing, because I've just got a lot of the natural skills. I didn't study marketing, but I enjoy being creative and I enjoy experimenting with that creativity, you know. Um and I think one way to make things better is is acknowledge that and know that you know you don't always have to hire people from privileged backgrounds who've got fancy marketing degrees. Um, there are lots of schemes where you can actually hire people who are in some way underprivileged um, and may well have in incredible creative skills because those things largely can't be taught. So look diversely for your people, um, and that. You know, there's lots of research that backs up that ultimately makes for stronger organizations um, and ones that are more representative of their customers. Um, so that's one way. Um, I think that's it. Is that a bit waffly? That's maybe a bit of a waffly answer, is it? Do you get what I'm getting at? I think that's, I think that's a great answer, yeah. I think, I don't know, if I'm interpreting it right, it's kind of about really getting across what your organization is based on the people that work there yeah. the values that they have and being as authentic as possible to them you know it's, it's finding out who you sometimes some organizations have never actually found out who they are and what yeah. their values are so like go and dig and find out and then when you find them and you're happy with them you've polished them a little bit whatever then just do everything the way that you order stationary all the way up to the way that you do your biggest ad campaign. Do everything by those values and mm. people will see it. They will trust it and the right people will be drawn towards it, both staff but also customers, donors, supporters out there. They will just be drawn towards it. You will, you will naturally self-select. You know, people will self-select and you'll draw in the right people. Whereas if you pretend to be something you're not, you'll, you'll just end up attracting the wrong people anyway. So it, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think with our company, something I've learned over the last year and something that my manager has said to me a few times is like what we're kind of about as a company is sort of showing off the work of other people and celebrating their success and how they're making a difference in the world. So like the charities that we're working with, I mean, they honestly are making big differences to people within the Sheffield community. Mm. And so through our marketing, something that we want to do more is sort of celebrate what they're doing rather than show off about us as individuals, because that's not really who we are. We're not a very showy offy sort of company. We're not very corporate. We don't do big like competitions and try and win awards and all that sort of thing. But we are just like happy that, we get the opportunity to work with like local people who are doing great things. So, mm. um, yeah, I think that's something I've definitely taken away from that answer is actually, ah, oh, well, that's something that us as a company could do more. And definitely me and my role in marketing is sort of uh, get that out there even more, to be honest. So, yeah, uh, that was a brilliant answer. And um, finally, where can people find you on, on social media or anything like that? you got the opportunity to give yourself a plug if you want to. Plug. 
Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm at willfrancis.com, and you can find everything that I do there primarily. I'm also on LinkedIn as Will Francis and Twitter at Will Francis. I mean, I'm at Will Francis pretty much everywhere. Um, but yeah, the main place is willfrancis.com. And if anyone wants to drop me a line and ask me about any of this stuff, you're totally free to do that. I will happily answer your questions uh, for free, you know, about this stuff. I just, I just enjoy hearing from people about their challenges. And if I can help, I will. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. Cheers for coming on. Hope uh, you at home have enjoyed watching, listening or reading this podcast. And I hope you have an amazing rest of your day.